Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 135 of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for this interview episode where we track down the best and brightest minds in the spirits and cocktail world so that we can share their secrets with you. This time around, we have an extremely special treat for you. During my recent West Coast road trip, I was able to grab some time with master distiller Lance Winters of St. George Spirits, based right by the bay in Alameda, California. Some of our East Coast listeners may be familiar with St. George from their line of excellent gins that have been available on more and more liquor store shelves lately, but you may be surprised to learn, if you're one of those East Coast folks, about their incredible work with fruit eau de vie and whiskey, which is where this brand really has its roots. During this interview with Lance, I refer to St. George as the Forrest Gump of the craft spirit space. They were there at the beginning. In fact, they were the first distillery to open in the U.S. since Prohibition. And there are a lot of key moments in the evolution of the booze industry, whether you're talking about spirits or cocktails, where you'd look around and there was St. George. We cover a lot of these incredible stories in this episode, and we do a tasting of four key products in the St. George portfolio so you can get a sense of what they're all about from a flavor perspective. But first, let's do what we always do and give you the chance to make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is the Classic Tuxedo. This cocktail is something I've been playing around with as actually a way to get to know St. George's various gin expressions, their terroir, locavore, and high rye gin in particular, all of which are very different and special. To make the Tuxedo cocktail, which is a riff on the martini, you'll need two ounces of gin, one ounce of Fino Sherry, which is a dry style of sherry, and several dashes of our Embitterment Orange Bitters. Just like a classic martini, you combine all these ingredients in a mixing glass with ice, stir for about 15 to 20 seconds, and then strain into a chilled cocktail glass and garnish with a citrus twist. Orange is classic, but occasionally, in fact more than occasionally, I'm partial to a lemon twist. Now, if you're a sherry nerd, which let's be honest, it's a fun thing to be, you might also consider using manzanilla sherry in place of a classic Fino. This is an even drier, kind of funky, saltier take on a dry sherry, and it might suit those of you who like to drink your martini in a way that might be considered a little bit dirty. So, now that you're armed with a stiff drink, let's turn our attention back to the interview. Some of the things I cover in this wide-ranging conversation with master distiller Lance Winters include How Lance's childhood fascination with flavors, spices, and seasonings eventually led him into the beer and whiskey world, where he met Jorg Rupf, the legendary founder of St. George Spirits. Why flavor is an ideal medium to use when you want to transfer some sort of emotion or experience between completely different people. What it took to grow St. George from a brand that started making Alsatian-inspired fruit brandies in a shipping container to one of the undisputed leaders in the craft spirits world. Then, we taste the following St. George spirits and give you in-depth notes. Their pear brandy, terroir gin, bruto americano aperitivo, and their single malt whiskey, all of which are delicious in their own rights. I can't overstate how large of an impact Lance has had on the craft spirits landscape, and I'm extremely honored to have had this deep, really candid chat with him for you to soak it all in. So please sit back, grab a glass of St. George Spirits, and enjoy this awesome interview and tasting with master distiller Lance Winters. Lance, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you very Um, much for having me. Can you... Introduce yourself in brief, because uh, I know you've got a, you've got 
a lot of accolades under your belt and a lot of spirits that you're kind of responsible for. But I just want to get the, the general overview of Lance Winters. Super brief, super easy. Lance Winters, that's me, uh, master distiller here at St. George Spirits. Um, been here for 24 years. And uh, yeah, that's, that's as brief as I'm going to go. And I'll go super brief on that and we can dig in. Nice. Yeah, let's do that. I want to start with um, the meals you had when you were growing up. Um, I, did your mom enjoy cooking? <laughs> um, I have to be really careful because uh, the last time I had a conversation about this, my mom ended up reading about it on the internet. Um, Christmas this year was really rough because uh, hopefully my mom won't hear this. Uh, I think podcasts are sort of out of her forte <laughs> when it comes to technology. So no, my mom did not enjoy cooking. I, let me let me give the caveat that there were a few dishes that my mom made that we love to eat. Uh, party chicken. Uh, which was a classic 70s style where you just took a bunch of chicken, threw it into a casserole dish with a mixture of apricot preserves, Russian dressing, and uh, Lipton onion soup mix. And, and baked it at like 350 until it was rubbery. Uh, and because it was nice and sweet, we loved it. Uh, but no, my mom did not like cooking. And so most of the time, didn't have a lot of enjoyable meals. Um, my grandmother liked to cook, um, and so we had some some good ones there. But at home, if I wanted to eat something that I really liked, I ended up having to make it myself. Yeah. And how did that influence the way you came to flavor? Um, well, so my, my upbringing was one where um, the spices that we had in our spice cabinet are still in my mom's spice cabinet. Uh, you, you know, the, the old package of the savory seasoning that's got the turkey on it. Like it's a, it's a four color process label. Um, that's there still, man. This thing is a, a relic of the, of the late sixties, early seventies. Um, so there wasn't a lot of seasoning used in food and I fell in love with seasonings, with spices. As soon as I, I let me backtrack. I grew up in Fremont. Uh, it's the South part of the Bay, South part of the East Bay. Uh, it's taken me years of therapy to just come out and say Fremont. I used to say, you know, I don't know, we're, we're just north of San Jose. Uh, it wasn't a special place. There wasn't a lot going on. But as soon as I started to experience flavors from other places and spices, I just got really, really excited uh, to the point that um, after going to a couple of really good Chinese restaurants in San Francisco, um, I asked for a walk for my birthday when I was 13. I still have my walk. It is it is jet black, well seasoned, beautiful thing. But uh, it it taught me to really love interesting combinations of flavors. Uh, it taught me to, and I think some of it might have been innate. Where as soon as I had a flavor like that, I wanted to dissect it. But before you could dissect something like that, that's so. Uh, I'm trying to think of the word for it. It's it's. Um, it's a, it's a thing that you, it's intangible really when you don't know what those flavors are coming from. So you have to study all those colors that are in the foods to really be able to pick them apart. Um, and so I would slowly do that as I'm learning about these different seasonings and learning which ones are present in different dishes, fell in love with that whole idea. Um, for a long time, what I wanted to be was a chef. And I, I loved cooking food at home. I loved cooking food for friends, for, for, for anybody that would sit down and eat the food that I was making. But I realized once I saw inside a kitchen, you have to be batshit crazy to work in a kitchen. Uh, it is high stress, high pressure. Uh, everybody's jumping around like crazy. You're working at somebody else's pace. And I don't like working at somebody else's pace. So um, I never became a chef. I still love to cook, but never became a chef. Um, what I did realize uh, years later, once uh, while I was in the Navy, I, I joined the Navy uh, looking for direction in my life. Um, and towards the end of my time in the Navy, when I was back on shore duty, um, a friend of mine introduced me to making beer. And suddenly it's like, okay, here's a place where you can play with flavors. Here's a place where there are a lot of traditions that have been around for centuries and they're waiting to be broken. And they're waiting. And when you when you break a tradition, you're starting a new tradition if, if what you've done is valid. And so I started playing around with beers and trying to trying to assert my personality over certain beers. 
Um, and it was great because I could make something when I had free time and it could sit somewhere. It could sit in the fridge. And then when friends had come over, I'd pop a beer open and be able to have, give them something that I made, but it was at my own pace. So that was, that was a pretty lovely thing. And it sounds like when you gave them that beer that you made, you kind of got to watch them go through that process that you were explaining earlier, where it's like you got to get lost in something before you can figure it out. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps because uh, you're, you're, pulling, you're pulling thoughts right out of my head. Uh, and I think that I think that there's something to your humanities background that you can credit with this. I'm serious. Um, I I think that when anything that's been commoditized is done right, when you pour your heart into it, people can pick that up. Um, it, not to not to get all like water for chocolate on it, but it's like there's emotional resonance, emotional valence to these things that we do, and and hopefully. If I've done it well in a beer, in a spirit, in something like that, people can pick up exactly what I'm trying to do. Um, to me, art is a method of conveying emotion from one human being to another, whether it's through painting, through poetry, through, through interpretive dance. Don't even ask me to do that one. Uh, anything like that. You're taking a feeling that you've got. You're putting it into this medium that has no emotion of its own and no place to hold emotion you're transferring that emotional content to another human being and hopefully they're picking it up. And if they're not picking it up exactly the way that, that you put it down, there's still value to it because you're, you're causing some sort of feelings for them. Uh, so it's, it's sort of a, it's a magical transference that takes place. Not yeah. to get all woo. This is not just California. It's, no, uh, this is real. No, it's not woo at all. Uh, Robert Frost has this famous essay called the shape a poem makes or the figure a poem makes. Okay. And he says that, Basically, to paraphrase, like what happens when when you read a successful poem is that there's this sense of transport, like like you have suddenly appeared somewhere that you never knew you had forgotten or never knew that you were about to remember something to that extent. And it's that sense of transport, the universal by way of the particulars. And I guess for the purposes of what we're talking about here, the universal by way of the particles, right, the flavor molecules that that you're – you're coaxing, you're engineering, um, whether you're talking about fermentation or distillation. Um, so yeah, I think, I think you and I are very much on the same page about, um, you know, the art of basically evoking a reaction through flavor. Um, so let's get back a little bit to the bio, uh, take folks through the process that took you from a, a home brewer to, um, your initial, Kind of interaction with the founder of St. George. Okay. So um, as I was getting out of the Navy, I was looking for some way to, to take brewing from my kitchen to, uh, to actually making a living doing it and was able to finagle a job at a small brew pub in Fremont um, and, uh, and then to another one in Hayward where I was able to, to get my hands into the, the brewing process. As I was doing that, um, one of my friends, who was was much more sophisticated than I, brought me a bottle of Lagavulin. And uh, up until then, my experience with whiskey was, this stuff's rough. This stuff is just something that will get you drunk ten times faster. Um, when I tried that Lagavulin, it was like another world opening up. It was a, a Robert Frost moment where suddenly... I'm, I'm being told a story on the palate. It's coming apart in different pieces. I'm picking up all kinds of different flavors, but even more so, there's, there's emotional content to it. I'm like, this is incredible. I never knew that this is what spirits were about. And I started wanting to learn more and more about whiskey and whiskey production. And one of the first things that I learned was that the first step to making whiskey is brewing a beer. And then you distill it, and then you barrel age it. And that's, that's the, the most basic sense of it. Um, and once I realized that, I set about to setting up a still in my garage. Um, kids, don't try this at home. It is against federal law. I believe that I'm past some sort of statute of limitations, so I'm comfortable saying it right now. Uh, but I set up a 25-gallon pot still in my garage and would bring a couple of kegs of beer home every week and distill them to see what different profiles I would get from, from different beer washes. Um, and was loving doing that. 
was also terrified anytime somebody knocked on my door that it was the feds. So I realized that what I wanted to do was legitimize this. So I took a bottle of some of my homemade hooch, and uh, I had heard about Jörg Rupp, the founder of St. George Spirits, but, um, through, through various uh, media outlets. And I knew that he was in Alameda. I was in Fremont back in those days, 25 minute drive. And so I hopped in my car with a bottle, showed up, introduced myself, and uh, my timing was incredibly lucky. Bill Mansart, the gentleman who was running the, the stills for York, he'd been doing so, I think, probably for over 10 years at that point. Um, he was ready to retire. And York said, well, let's, let's, first he tried the whiskey. And uh, his, his pronouncement on it was that it was inoffensive. Um, and I was heartbroken. But, uh, but at the same time, I was happy because he said, we'll try you out for a month and see what happens. I went back to the brew pub the next day, I quit my job, and I said, if this doesn't work out, I'll figure out some other way to get into distilling. Here I am, 25, 24 years later. Um, so uh, it all worked out, but what was, what was great was that Jorg's way of bringing me in, he said, he said great, you want to make whiskey? That's fantastic. He Mr. Miyagi'd the whole thing. He's like, great, go distill those cherries. Now go distill those raspberries. Go distill those pears. And what that did was it really taught a love for distillation in all its forms. If you go in focus just on one thing, I think you miss out on a lot of, a lot of latitude. I think as, as Americans, we like to be able to, to go in different directions. We like to innovate. Uh, and uh, diving right into whiskey with only whiskey as, as a reference point, it's far too self-referential. And so we'd end up making something that's far too much like something somebody else has already made. So teaching me to love distillation first before, before we started making whiskey was one of the most brilliant things. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about Jorg and, um, you know, obviously with some of these bottles lined up here that, that we're going to taste in a few moments here, like, you know, you're, you're kind of a, a driving force, um, but, but he seems to be almost this mythic figure, uh, and, and even just the way you're describing the Mr. Miyagiing of yeah. the process, I, I just I, I want our listeners, many of whom are on the East Coast, to, to be able to appreciate what he gave to the craft spirit scene. So, um, God, there's so much to say. Uh, first of all, he is like a mythic character, uh, in as much as he's um, incredibly intelligent, uh, master of multiple languages. Uh, incredible tennis player, great golfer, uh, concert violinist, um, classic, classic gentleman, uh, and uh, and was during the during the the first fifteen years that I was here, more of a father figure than a boss. I mean, just really kind and generous, incredible human being. To the rest of the world, um, he was the person who was crazy enough to start a small distillery when when the laws changed, allowing that sort of thing to happen. He was the very first person to start a small distillery in the United States since Prohibition. Um, it was a daunting task because all the distribution models were based on these products that everybody knew and knew really well, and and very few distributors would want to carry something like a fruit brandy made in, in at that time, uh, Emeryville, California, in a 20 foot by 20 foot crate, essentially. But your was driven. These are spirits that even though there's no market for it, in, or there was no market for it in the United States at the time, there was a reason for it to exist. You take a pear, a raspberry, a cherry, when they're at their peak of ripeness, there's something really beautiful about them. And distilling them and taking those characteristics that you truly love and putting those into a bottle so that you can deliver that to a glass so somebody else understands what you're feeling when you first grab one of those pieces of fruit, that's a magical thing. And he wanted to be able to do that. Um, and he did. And he was like an indie filmmaker. He was critically acclaimed. Uh, we have letters from the early days of St. George Spirits from... Uh, from people like Julia Child, who were saying, this is the, some of the best eau de vie I've had in my whole life, and I used to love drinking eau de vie when I was in France. And, and great reviews, things like that. And then there was no actual box office success. 
Uh, 90% of what we were making back then, we were selling to Germany, Austria, and Switzerland because nobody here in the States knew what to do with this stuff. The only people in the States that were drinking were people who had visited those places, enjoyed it, and wanted to be able to be transported back to their vacations right. in, in Europe. Um, but he's, in addition to being an uh, intelligent, uh, polymath, polyglot, incredible guy, uh, he's a German and a Taurus, which makes him double stubborn. Uh, and so he just stuck with it. Uh, he was happy just being able to make these products and, and doing his thing. So he stuck with it and uh, was still in business by the time I showed up on the doorstep. Um, the, the story starts to shift at that point. We started laying down barrels of whiskey once we figured out exactly what mash bill we wanted for that whiskey. Um, and then, so during that time, making brandy from pears, raspberries, cherries, doing a little bit of grappa for some wineries, uh, and then spending some time doing whiskey, there's still seven, eight months of the year when there's nothing going on. We do a little bit of bottling. Uh, I'd stick around to be able to ship stuff out, but as much as possible, I'd go out into the market with, uh, with our distributor sales team. And as I went out into the market, I'm seeing this massive proliferation of flavored vodkas. By and large, they were all terrible. I would, I'd, I'd see them all over the bar. I'd see them all over the, the cocktail lists, and I'd be like, can I try one of these? And I try one. I won't name any brand names, but I'd try one that that purported to be an orange flavored vodka. The first thing I got in the nose was poorly distilled ethanol. The next thing I got was a chemical approximation of a piece of fruit. On the palate, similar story. And I thought, this is amazing. These things are selling like crazy. People are drinking them like crazy. We're making these fruit brandies that smell and taste just like the fruit on the label. We're making a promise that we're delivering. They're making a promise that they're not. And I came back to York and I said, the only difference here is the language that they're speaking. They're speaking vodka. We're speaking Eau de Vie. And I said, what if we did a vodka? And so that's when we started thinking about doing a vodka. That's the gestation of Hangar One, um, which changed the shape of everything that we did. Uh, it, it put us in front of a lot more people. Uh, Odevi has changed dramatically since then, but there was no way that we could have done that just on Odevi. Um, and, uh, and the Hangar One just really took off. It catapulted us in front of a lot of people. Right. And still right next door. Still, yeah, now it's, yeah, now they're next door. So, yeah. um, but, uh, yeah, so we, we, it's a brand that we sold, I think it's 11 years ago now. Wow, yeah. It's crazy to think that, um, and uh, during the time that we were making that, we, uh, I had been making absinthe here. Um, I had heard about it. People had talked about it. I'm like, what is this stuff? And the only way, I, I didn't have the wherewithal to be able to get it from Europe. Um, I didn't have the money to travel to Europe. And the internet was still too young to actually be able to buy things like that off the internet. So um, I found a recipe and I made it on a lab still. And uh, the first batch was utterly undrinkable. Um, the next batch, I, I figured out exactly what I did wrong and fixed that and was like, okay, this is interesting and spent the next 10 years playing with it. Um, and then when the law changed in 2007, allowing it to be sold legally here in the States, um, I had one that I'd been working on for 10 years. So we launched that. We were the first domestically produced absinthe available in the United States. Um, yeah. And, and jumped around through a lot of different things during that time period. Yeah. You know what it kind of occurs to me as I'm following you through all these inflection points, what I think most people don't realize, and I think what makes this story most compelling for me, is that St. George, you know, from the moment that you began this business through all of these little landmarks that you're, you've just laid out for us, you're kind of the Forrest Gump of a <laughs> lot of either regular, regulatory or trends. Uh, so think of... Right place, right time sort of a situation. Right. Um, I mean, that's a very simple way of putting it, but... Well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm Forrest Gump, so I'm a very simple man, so... <laughs> uh, think about just the decision, and, and this is probably not what Jorg was thinking when, when he chose O to V, but another word for O to V is schnapps. Sure. Uh, and if back in the early 80s, yeah. correct, when this, when, when this was just getting off the ground... Schnapps was 
peach schnapps was or, fuzzy navel. Yeah, yeah. Or, or peppermint schnapps. And, 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 right. yeah. and, and that's not what a true schnapps would be if you were to go to you know, Switzerland or uh, Bavaria or some of these places in Germany where they're actually distilling it. Now, of course, Jorg is from Alsace, you know, kind of in the that, that border region between France and Germany, so there's more French influence. Maybe eau de vie just seemed like a, you know, just the, the correct term to use, but it also kept you away from all those negative connotations. Then we fast forward 10 years, early 90s. This is you know, you know, early to mid '90s. This is when all of a sudden the Cosmo arrives on the scene. This is flavored vodka making its imprint on American cocktail culture. This is Absolute Citron, you know, with cranberry juice. That that was the Cosmo, and and you're right there. You're saying, hmm, flavored vodka. This is kind of what we're doing. We're just doing it way better, and we're doing it with the right intentions behind it. Um, and then, you know, up through the, the legalization of absinthe, you'd been working on it for 10 years, which is like, you know, an insane head start on anything. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's just, it's, it's really cool to, to hear all these little stories because I think that when people in my DC market go into a good liquor store mm -hmm. and they walk over the gin uh, shelves and they see the high rye, the botanivore and the locavore gin, they say, oh, sweet new gins. That's they don't realize the rest of the iceberg that is underwater that that brought those to the East Coast so that they can say, hey, cool, a new gin. It's a, it's a difficult thing. And there's a, you know, uh, first of all, as as Americans, we're um, we've got a short attention span most of the time and we don't want to have to learn about something. It's one of the reasons that marketing companies are just the win at, at everything, because they find these great, comfortable little sound bites to be able to describe things. And. It's one of the reasons that I've never done well, uh, like like going out to a club and trying to meet women because I don't have the short pickup line. It's like you need to take the time to get to know me. That's just the way it is, and uh, and so it's the same way with us as a as a distillery. The hopefully the more you get to know about us, the deeper you can appreciate what it is we do. But I think that I think that you're spot on with something with the comment about intentionality. Um, it's one of the things that I believe sets St. George spirits apart from other distilleries. Um, a lot of, so when we started, when, when Jorg started the business 38 years ago now, um, nobody else was doing it. A little while after he started, Ansley Cole and Hubert Germain Robin started Germain Robin. Um, and, uh, great California brandy. It, some of I, I would even take away the qualifier California. I think Hubert made some of the best brandies in the world. Sure. They're incredible. Um, you look at uh, at uh, Domaine Trebet, uh and the products that they're making. They came in shortly after after Jorg and Ansley. Um, and then nobody for a while. And it took a long time for other people to, to catch on with it. But I think what ended up happening, a lot of, a lot of brewers realized that there wasn't a whole lot farther they could go with their craft and they realized that hey this is something that we can do that's that's really interesting a lot of unexplored territory um and suddenly probably 20 years ago we started to see a, a, a big shift a big acceleration into it and as soon as that starts to happen there are more people that see that this is a growth category and as you see a category growing, you see people whose real intention is purely entrepreneurial. And so there are a lot of people that have jumped in who just want to make some money. They've seen this being a double digit growth category for years. It's like, that's, that's where we should put our money. We shouldn't open uh, a gym or a roller hockey rink or uh, another copy center because everybody's getting cheap printers with their computers. Let's open a distillery. And they don't have the intention of shifting the dialogue about a spirit. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the things that I talk about when I talk to people about gin. Um, so many people are making a gin that is essentially inspired by London dry gin. And it's like, if every, if every vocal performer was inspired by Elvis Presley, you'd have a whole record store. That's all Elvis impersonators. That's boring. I don't want that because you know, even if you're even if you're a really cool one, 
You know, like the, there's a guy, I think his name is Elvez, and he's a Chicano Elvis impersonator. He puts his own spin on it. Uh, that's cool, but it's still, it's still totally derivative of Elvis. So starting with a new point of view, if you consider the industry to be a conversation, you come into the conversation, you want to say something new. If you walk in and you say something that somebody else has said for a hundred years, what have you added to the conversation? You have added nothing. So we want to make sure that every, every spirit that we put out, we're adding something new to the conversation. Yeah. And that's definitely, at least to me, one of the hallmarks of St. George, um, and uh, we're actually going to get to taste and kind of discuss some of the flavors there in, in just a moment here. Um, so I'm with Lance Winters. We're going to do a quick reset. And then when we come back, we're going to taste a few of the amazing St. George spirits. Stay tuned. <laughs> All right. And we're back. Uh, Lance, what would you like to start us off here as we explore some of the uh, portfolio items that your distillery uh, creates. Not not to harp on the gump comment, but I'm a symbol man, so I like to go in uh, in a little bit of a chronological order. Okay. Um, I feel like starting with the pear brandy is always such a great way because it says so much about St. George Spirits, uh, about how we started, about York's philosophy. Um, and one of the things that I didn't mention about him is the fact that he is an incredible stickler for quality. When I first showed up at the distillery, there were there were literally tanks of things that would never see the light of day because you distilled them, you didn't think they were good enough for release. You release something that's not good enough, that name right there drops down. It's so European. It is. And 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 it is one of the things that has stuck with us. There we make a lot of things and we make a we try out a lot of things. And they're things that other people would probably proudly put their labels on and put out. We can't do that. Yeah, so. And it does go back to what you were saying about Americans having short attention spans. It's not just short attention spans. It's, um, it's also the privilege of space, I think, where it's like we have this big country, especially here. Uh, I, I just came from L.A. Everyone, everyone drives everywhere. Kind of the same in most of California. Um, you can just drive away from a problem if you have it. But I feel like living in Europe it's kind of like living in a small apartment building where you can hear people having sex in the yeah. next apartment. So it's like, you better, if that's the case, you'd better have good sex. Yeah. In Vegas, you pay, you pay extra for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, I, you're totally right. Um, oh. Pears, nothing else. Uh, this is all Bartlett pears. These are dry farmed organic Bartlett's that come from the Western slopes of the Colorado Rockies. Mm. Uh, we used to get all of our fruit exclusively from California, but more and more the orchards have been torn out to make room for Pinot, which makes more money per acre than the pears would. Um, fortunately, these farmers in Colorado are still growing and they've got beautiful organic fruit. Uh, it tends to be smaller because it's dry farmed, which gives us more skin. Skin gives a little bit of spice note. Uh -huh. um, I got a lot of that spice note right out of the bottle and then as it's opened up, it's just like reminds me of being a kid again when my mom would hand me that plastic bowl that's yeah. all scratched up with... Yeah a pear all, chunked all, up. All chopped up for you, yeah. And, and, and that's the beauty of it. It's, again, it's transportive. It takes you to, to your scent memory of what pears are all about. Um, so many stories about this one. I, uh, I love to drink it. Um, I took my son out to dinner one night at a restaurant in Oakland called Oliveto. Uh, had a really lovely dinner, and I asked for a glass of pear would be at the end of dinner. They brought it, I think at the time my son was probably six years old, and he said, can I try it? I said, no, you can't, you can't. you're too young. I said, you can dip your finger in it. Dipped his finger in it, tasted it, I said, what do you think? He said, it's really good. I said, well, what is it? What are you tasting? And he said, peaches. I'm like, okay, that's, that's good. And he said, wait a minute, it's pears. I'm like, if a six-year-old, and I, I, I know, sorry, there are probably people who are listening to this, you let your six-year-old try alcohol? I, I did. Uh, and uh, if he can pick out the fruit in this, it's it's an easy thing. It's 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 a win. It's it's so funny too because I think today in the market we tend to privilege complexity, uh, and man, there's there's something almost stupefying, like not stupefying in the in the like dumbing sense, but stupefying in the like it makes you stop and just really pause over it in a way that I don't really pause over other types of distillates sometimes. Yeah. And, um, if, if 
I'm understanding the comment about it being a privileged thing um, or putting my own take on that. Um, oftentimes, the vocabulary that we use to describe the things that we taste like if we're tasting wine. And wine tends to be one of those things where, um, you know, I'm picking up tobacco and old shoe leather and things like that. And those are super valid. But you have, there's, there is a sense of privilege that comes with that. Um, and what I want to, what I want to say to all of your listeners is that the guy who's the, the, the head sommelier somewhere who's picking that glass up and telling you about all those things, his palate is no better than yours. He's learned some words along the way. Trust your own palate. Your mm -hmm. palate is the product of millions of years of evolution, just like his. And, and when you smell it and taste it, think about whatever your impressions are. There, there were times that when you and I would taste pear. Think about how you would, like, if you were tasting flour, how would you describe flour? Well, it tastes sort of flowery. It, it's hard to do it. Yeah. But if you dig down a little deeper, you can find descriptors. And as we're talking about pear brandy, we've got different batches that we're getting ready to put together uh, for a bottling. You know, well, this one's a little more steely than the other one. This mm -hmm. one's a little warmer. This one's, we even used shinier. This one tastes shinier to me. And, and as long as the person that you're talking to understands where you're coming from on that, then it's, it's an acceptable language. Um, what I get here beyond that spice, beyond what is just truly pear, I get honey. Um, I get, I get some, mm -hmm. uh, really nice warm, soft apple as well. Yeah. I get like um, the honey crisp apple. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, and, and I, I love the, the influence of the skin too. I mean, I, to me, one of the hallmarks of the Bartlett pear is that skin. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and to the point where as it's, as it's flowing off the palate, I get a sense of that almost gritty texture mm -hmm. that you have from the flesh of the fruit. Um, and it's just, it's such a remarkable sensory picture of what that fruit's all about. Yeah. And can you just give us uh, a few numbers like the proof, any, any other yeah, relevant, so, um, so yeah, label, it, label claims? It's uh, it's 40% ethanol by volume. Uh, each bottle represents about 30 pounds of fruit. Um, we, uh, we crush it, ferment it cold with champagne yeast, uh, and then okay. distill it. And so the only things in there, pears, yeast, and then water to bring it down from distillation strength. Distillation strength is usually average around 70%, sometimes mm -hmm. a little lower, sometimes a touch higher. Um, this is the, the largest still that we use to distill our pears is 500 liters mm -hmm. or 130 gallons. So um, it's a... Uh, that's a... It's a small batch process. Yep. And, 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 and that's that, not bending the meaning of small batch. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's definitely small batch. And the... Who gives a shit? I mean, small batch, what, is it, what does it even mean? It, it's important to us from the perspective that it gives us a certain ratio of copper contact. Mm -hmm. um, again, we pick up these buzz phrases uh, that, that marketing companies fling at us, small batch. Um, there are a lot of small batch whiskeys that you see that there ain't nothing small batch about them. Um, these are produced in very small batches because of the fact that that copper contact takes away a lot of sulfur components from, mm -hmm. the, from the spirit vapor. And, and leaves you with nothing but the impression of food. So that's, that's what's really important there. So 40% alcohol, uh, 30 pounds of fruit, 750 milliliter bottle. Yeah. It's all pretty straightforward. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, let's, let's get to this gin. Uh, yes, right now we're, we're getting to two products. The, the kind of middle of this lineup are two products I'm actually fairly familiar with. Great. So I'm excited about this. I'm excited about this as well. Uh, it's it's another interesting thing to talk about. Uh, when you talk about making a fruit brandy, your job as a distiller with a fruit brandy is to not screw it up. You get the best quality fruit that you can get, and then you shepherd it through the processes of fermentation, distillation, so that all the things you love about it show up to the picture. Making a gin is a sheer act of willpower. You are in willpower and composition. You are taking all these different colors and you're painting something from it. In the instance here, we're painting a landscape and the whole idea about this landscape was being able to create something that was evocative of Mount Tam. Um, again, the story of my son, uh, when he was eight years old, he's 21 now. So, so 13 years ago, uh, I was picking him up from summer camp and it had been a long stressful day. I'm stressed out because I'm late to go pick him up. 
and I show up out in the woods to go get him and suddenly I'm just, I'm, I'm loosening up. I'm feeling pretty good about being there, even though I'm, I'm going to catch some shit for being late. Um, and I'm realizing that it's because I'm smelling this place. That's like, it's a relaxing place. And I came back thinking, okay, what is it about that place? I want to distill it. I want to distill a photograph of this place so that you look at a photo of Mount Tam. It's like, oh, great. It's a mountain. It's got some trees, shit like that. Um, you can't sense it. Mm-hmm. I pick this glass up and I'm on a hike. Um, and the reason for that is we've distilled Douglas fir, mm-hmm. coastal sage, wild fennel, and bay laurel. Those are things that are all in that landscape. We fill in gaps in the landscape. There are things like forest floor mulch, all those decomposing leaves that they smell. Those are filled in by orris root and angelica root. They've got that, that great, earth, yeah, yeah. great earthy characteristics to both of those. Um, a dusty sunbaked trail. As you're walking up just like hard packed earth and dust is flying up, there's a sweet smell of that dust. Cinnamon does that. It does it really beautifully. So cinnamon is in here as well. Um, we walk roast the coriander used to be on the walk that I got for my birthday, but I didn't want to trust the staff with that one too much longer. Uh, so we bought a walk for here. Um, and obviously juniper, uh, orange peel and lemon peel for brightness. And that's it in this one. It's, it's kind of creepy how those main four or five botanicals, uh, the, the wild fennel, the coastal sage, the bay laurel, uh, the, the spruce, is it the spruce or the fir? Um, Douglas fir? Douglas fir. Uh, I grew up on a Christmas tree farm. Okay. Uh, you know, it's it's creepy. It's creepy how all of those come through, not in succession. You know how sometimes you have that linear flavor experience where you're like, all right, well first this hits and then this fades into this or whatever. They don't, they don't come through in succession, but as you think about one, it kind of, you know, you can focus on it. It kind of like wafts up in front of you. You're like, damn, you know, and that is, Beyond being a, an act of sheer will, I think from a, a mathematical and process perspective, it's it's almost a miracle. Uh, it's got to be. It, um, maybe. Uh, but I, it, there was a lot of trial and error. There was about, about six months of really refining this um, from, a, from a, just a pure recipe scale. And then another couple months of refining it once we moved it from the lab stills out to the big stills because it's not a, a direct scaling up exercise. No. <laughs> uh, it sadly never works quite that way. No. Um, but I, it, it was terrifying because in my head, I knew exactly what this gin had to smell and taste like. And, and I couldn't stop at anything less than that. Um, but on the plus side, once we got there, it's, it's still one of my favorite things to drink. I, um, and what I love is we'll have people who come into our tasting room who say, oh, no, no, I, I don't like gin. I don't want to try any of the gins. And I'll say, please, if you, I'm going to pour this for you. You smell it. If you don't like the way it smells, I'll drink it for you. And if you like the way it smells, then please try it. Nine times out of ten, somebody who swears they hate gin will walk away loving that. Yeah. And, and we didn't do that by dumbing gin down and saying, no, we're going to pull juniper out of it. It's got the same amount of juniper that, that our botanical gin has. But we did it by elevating all the other ingredients, by, by making it so that it's not a linear thing, mm-hmm. by making it so that you're, you're looking at a whole forest. So juniper isn't the only thing that you're seeing. So, and, and it makes beautiful cocktails. Um, I love to drink it just in a martini with some oysters. Uh, yep. I believe very firmly that the, uh, uh, the Bramble, which was invented in the eighties, um, uh, Dick Gratzel, I think was the, uh, the bartender that invented it in London. I think he saw this gin coming somehow and knew that it would be perfect. In it. Uh, there's, there's a place where the, um, the creme de mure, the blackberry liqueur intersects with the landscape of this and the two of them feed off of one another in a really beautiful way. I made a, um, Called a uh, creme de bois. Uh, I grew up. Love the name. Uh, ne- next to that Christmas tree farm, there was this um, patch of wild black raspberries that, that grew right on the side of my driveway, which is this quarter mile long dirt road. Um, and so my mom took a picture and, and sent it to me 
about a year ago, not a year ago, a year and a half ago and said, hey, these are ready. I said, all right, you want to do a project? And so we did We did the, the black raspberry liqueur. And I, I think I've actually had like a little uh, almost kind of like a super boozy cure yeah. with the this and the, the remaining bottle of that that I had. That sounds lovely. And it's, it's really nice. Um, Very cool. Yeah, this is – and I've actually – Gotten into some some deep trouble, although very much in the confines of my own condo, so so it didn't uh, <laughs> didn't result in any uh, any arrests or anything. Combining this product and the next one, we're going to taste. I I love combining those two, and uh, and I can explain to you why. For me, there's a synergy between the two of them, uh, and maybe it'll be the same for you. I um, back to your your uh, growing up at that Christmas tree farm. Um, I grew up at a distillery for the last 24 years <laughs> and a couple years into it, I started when Christmas was over chopping up my Christmas tree and, uh, and popping it into the still with high proof and distilling Christmas trees. It's one of the things that led me to understand what I could do with ingredients for the terroir gin. Mm -hmm. uh, but I always did it because for me, that smell, that's Christmas. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't meals. It wasn't presents. It was the fact that the house was full of that smell of the Christmas tree. And for us, it was typically noble fir, um, and noble fir has a little bit more citrus to its nose and a little bit more wintergreen. Uh, but man, it was lovely. Mm. Um, this is another act of construction uh, uh, composition. I wanted to do initially. I wanted to do a fernet. And I failed miserably every time I was trying. And one of the things that I realized was for that Branca is pretty much perfect as it is. And there are already a lot of really beautiful Fernets. And I think there are a lot of new ones coming out that are delicious. Um, and I'm not going to try and force myself to create a Fernet when it's not working. Uh, all the flavors that I really gravitated towards that I wanted to use in a Fernet were saying brighter. And so mm -hmm. when I finally decided to go brighter and go in an aperitivo direction, everything started to fall into place. Um, this one is um, gentian, which gives the, the base bitterness. That's, that's that big punch of bitterness right up front. Uh, there's uh, uh, benzoin gum, which is this mm -hmm. really beautiful resin. Uh, and there's uh, balsam fir, which I discovered at, uh, at a friend's wedding. I was out in uh, Western Maine. Uh, hey, Sam and Jess. Uh, went to Sam and Jessica's wedding out in uh, center level and the smell of the balsam fur out there was just really beautiful. That's one of the places where this crosses over so nicely. Uh, Cascara Sagrada, which is the bark of the California buckthorn tree, gives the impression of cinnamon and sandalwood without mm -hmm. there being cinnamon or sandalwood there. Right. You, um, see, you actually see that popping up in a lot of candles these days. Yeah. Cascara. Yeah. That's like a big buzzword in the candle. It's a, it's, it's a lovely aroma. I can totally understand yeah. why. It's something that you see in, uh, in incense as well. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the Bruto. Bruto uh, Americano. Yeah. Right. And am I correct in assuming that that means dry? No. Uh, I, 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 I can see that. Uh, I was going more for... Uh, so in Italian, Bruto is ugly. Uh, so uh -huh. Bruto Americano, ugly American. Uh, this was conceived during an election year. Uh, so there you go. Uh, doesn't matter which side you fall on. We were all ugly Americans that year. Um, so, but all I, I wanted all those flavors to come together to to give something more than just bitterness. Uh, there's uh, California Seville orange peel, mm. pink peppercorn, mm. uh, oolong tea, fresh uh, fresh ginger. Just this whole host of ingredients that that. Um, Bitterness comes first, and then and then you get that that bright citrus in the finish. But I wanted to fill up the mid palate. I felt like yeah. a lot of aperitivi just missed out on that mid palate contribution. Mm -hmm. So that was a that was a big place for for me to be able to play. What I think an aperitivo is is a perfect place for you to, you know, uh, after having created this gin that is hyper local in a, at least a manner of speaking, and creating eau de vie that at that point were you know probably being sourced all locally. You know, now you're working with some of these ingredients like oolong tea, um, you know, uh, like ginger that are, that are just not local. And that very much kind of mirrors the history of Aperitivi and, and why the Italians were the first to kind of corner the market on it because they Having had all the spice trade. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So it, it kind of, you know, there's a there's a, a great logic to to the way that you know I, I see this progressing, and I to me sometimes when I think about innovation, um, you hear especially entrepreneurs saying, "All right, well, we're gonna." Uh, jump off a cliff and build the plane on the way down. Um, there's an anxiety that comes with innovation sometimes. And there's a, you know, kind of like driving through the fog and, you know, all you can see is, you know, 10 feet in front of you. Uh, but I think if you can find a compelling enough logic to to kind of ground that, it it kind of justifies the process a little bit, I think. And and it's it's really nice to sit here and talk with you because, you know, I'm familiar with the products. I'm familiar with how they work at a, at a flavor level, but it, it's great to hear um, the background for it, and it, it's uh, it makes it even more compelling to me. If that makes any sense. Awesome. Yeah, it totally does. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. Hmm. And it, it's it's probably the first time in in many years anybody's ever said that that we're logical in any way at St. George. So um, I'm I'm going to make Ellie listen to this twice. <laughs> good. Good. Ellie, Ellie's my wife, just in case. Um, so. This is this is fun because we're um, we're now finishing our spirits tasting on what it was that brought me here to St. George Spirits. Yes. Um, this is our single malt. This is the 19th bottling of our single malt, malt uh, hence the name Lot 19. Um, one of the things that that I thought about when we first started making whiskey was that whiskeys are. Whiskies are made from pale malted barley. It's either peat smoked, not peat smoked, or some combination of the two. That's what single malts were. Um, but as an eau de vie distiller, which I became before I became a whiskey distiller, um, I realized that an eau de vie can be incredibly flavorful and layered and beautiful as it flows from the still, not just from you know, barrel aging. Um, and I thought, how do you do that with a whiskey? Well, you do that by using grains that are sm uh, that are roasted a little bit more heavily. So this is two row pale. It's crystal malt, which is the the sort of caramelized version of malted barley that you that you would see going into an amber beer. Uh, gives that amber color. Gives that great malty sweetness. Um, gives some toasted nut character to it as well chocolate malt and black patent malt, the things that would go into a porter, a stout, or a brown ale um, that give the cocoa, coffee, and sort of metallic tones. Um, and then uh, a malt that's called Bamberg malt that's smoked in Germany uh, in a town called Bamberg over, uh, over Alder and Beechwood. Totally different smoke profile. Mm -hmm. um, if you go with peat, you're going to smell just like somebody's single malt. Um, I do want to play with doing some peat smoked malts, but I wanted to establish a house style before I had something that was that was like that. Um, this whiskey says more about us than it says about whiskey. It says that we like our whiskeys a little on the sweet side. Mm -hmm. uh, this is all about chocolate, roasted hazelnut, maybe some pine nut, um, big smack of cocoa. Um, what you've got in the glass here is average age of about nine years old. The oldest barrel that went into this is 18 years old. The youngest is five years old. Um, it's a combination of used bourbon cask, uh, recoupered French oak, some port, some sherry, some apple brandy, and then some uh, uh -huh. California Sauterne style. Yeah. So this is a very, uh, I guess, blend, blending intensive product, right? It is. And um, it's, it's a very, very carefully selected number of barrels that go into it. Um, and... I can't take any credit for the selection of barrels. I can take some credit for shaping some of our, our aging profile, but Dave Smith, who's second in command here, he's head distiller now. Um, he's got an amazing patience and genius for figuring out which barrels should go together. And the lot 19 of our lot series, people ask, you know, is, are, are you guys striving for consistency in your releases of whiskey? No, we're striving for what can we do that's the absolute best from what we've got in barrel stock right now? And this is absolute best of everything that he's ever done. So I'm, yeah, yeah, can't say enough in in favor of Dave's abilities. On the nose, I was I was a little confused at first because I, I didn't realize all the different cask finishes that went into this, and I was like, 
you know, is this is this plummy? Is this you know what, what's the fruit on here? So just hearing the the the, Sauter, the California Sauterne, the apple brandy, I was like, all right, I'm not my, I'm not broken. Like, yeah, there, no, not at all. It's uh, it and it does require some thought realignment, you know. But that's that's what I want. I I, I don't want to make this super easy. I want it to be enjoyable. But I want you to think, okay, what what's going on here? So, the um, the California Saturn barrels um, they give you're I mean, you're picking up stone fruit from that. Yeah. Uh, it's a uh, it's nectarine, but they also give a little bit of rose geranium, and it's just they're such beautiful barrels. I feel like most people who are familiar with Scotch whiskey as synonymous with single malt would not identify this as a, a single malt, perhaps. Um, do you have any thoughts on the American single malt category? Um, I have a ton of thoughts. It's probably it's probably one of the places where um, I would butt heads with more people <laughs> than not. Um, there are a lot of people that feel the need to establish regulations for that category. Um, and my question to them is why? I, what you should really be pushing for is just pure transparency on a label. Mm-hmm. You don't need to have a category. Um, I think that they want to be able to have separate shelf space from other products. And I get that just purely from uh, a, an economics perspective, a marketing perspective. But if that's driving what you're calling something, you might want to rethink that. Mm-hmm. I believe that there can be uh, a thoughtfully laid out American single wall category. But I think that it's, as a category of things that people are producing, it's still way too far into its infancy for us to be saying this is, this is what it has to be. I mean, I've been making this whiskey for 23 years now, and I think that there still needs to be latitude for experimentation before we lock it into a box and say it has to be this. Mm-hmm. You know, you think about the, the German beer purity law, the, the Reinheitsgebot, uh, was written in the 1600s, and it listed all the things that you can put into beer and can't put into beer. It basically said what beer has to be. Nobody had discovered yeast at that point. If you really wanted to follow the letter of the law, you can't add yeast to this stuff. And, and it's like, no, you need to wait until you understand more about this before, before you really confine it. It's probably, I'm probably not putting it as best as I possibly can, but I think that, I think that there needs to be a lot more latitude for, for interpretation, for personal interpretation. Otherwise it's like, it's just a geographic designation for something that's already done in Scotland. Right. And I think, uh, there's a big trend in other spirits categories like rum, for example, with geographic designations and denominations of origins. Um, and I think right now it, it, it almost lines up with the kind of like populist conservatism of, you know, today's zeitgeist to say like, let's lock it down. Let's build the wall so yeah. that, you know, you, somebody on the other side can't call it this. Uh, but I think that kind of goes against what makes a lot of American spirits, especially in the past 30 to 40 years so great is that we didn't have those constraints. And although I do think it's important to recognize that champagne comes from the champagne region of France, if it's not broke on our side of the Atlantic. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll totally give you that. I mean, uh, Oscar Mayer really has no claim to the name Bologna. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it is a far cry from what you would get for, at a really, really great deli in Italy. But um, I think to your point, and it comes back to the point, uh, a, a philosophical interpretation of your point about having lots of space. Mm-hmm. As Americans, we have lots of space. And it gives us the wide open prairie. The beauty of it isn't just the fact that here's a lot of land that we can settle. It's like, I can do whatever I want here. This is a blank slate. And that's the way we like to look at a spirits category. It's a blank slate. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a, there's a material that you have to make it from for it to fit into this category, but that's it. That's, that's okay. Now let me, let me play with this. Let me, let me screw it up if I need to screw it up, but let me do my thing. That's the part of it that makes it American single malt is the fact that we are, I think it's the best part of Americans is that we are sort of renegades and we do things our own way. Uh, it doesn't always work, but when it does, it's an amazing thing. And, and that's the way I want 
American single malt as a category to be treated. Yeah. Uh, just just a, the, the wide open prairie, a yeah. place for all of us to play. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm here with Lance Winters at St. George Spirits. We just tasted through four amazing expressions from their portfolio. Uh, we'll be right back with some quick lightning round questions. And we're back with Lance Winters here at St. George Spirit. And uh, we're going to hit some lightning round. So, Lance, what's your favorite cocktail? And if you don't have a favorite of all time, uh, what's something you're more recently obsessed with? Okay. Can I, can I list two? Yes. Um, my, my absolute favorite is a margarita. Uh, and, and it doesn't use anything that I make. But as soon as I sip one, I start to feel it flowing through my veins. I imagine that it's what uh, a heroin addict feels when they shoot up. Uh, it's just this amazing, comforting radiance that flows through my body and it's an amazing thing yeah um but uh but one that i absolutely adore that usually shows off the prowess of a bartender in an amazing way is a clarified milk punch Ooh. and what's great about that is that you can use so many different types of spirits to make a really good clarified milk punch but it's one of these things that it's it's a bit of it's a little bit of trickery. Uh, you look at this thing in a glass that looks innocuous and clear, and as you sip it, the mouthfeel is so radically different from the way it looks. Uh, and the potential for layers and layers of flavor on top of that just blows me away. So it's, uh, it is the cocktail that I most admire. Yeah. I'm a huge milk punch, uh, milk punch fan. I'm glad you said that. Um, awesome. Awesome. If you were a cocktail ingredient, what would you be and why? It would be a Luxardo cherry uh, uh, because uh, it's an aspirational goal. Uh, the Luxardo cherry, I believe, is probably one of the most amazing things. And again, to talk about how how certain industrial processes have taken really, really awful things, really wonderful things, mm -hmm. and turned them out in an awful way. The the radioactive pink cherries that we often see in cocktails have nothing to do with a true true cherry and uh and the the the, the cherries that uh that luxardo puts out they're a textural experience they're a flavor explosion they're incredible and uh i'm not saying that that's what i am i'm saying that's what i would like to be so yeah man do you ever get just like a gallon can of those things so uh funny you should ask uh the <laughs> there, there's a gentleman in san francisco named tony folio he's uh he's an industry veteran um, I don't want to even say how many years he's been at it. He doesn't look like it. Uh, he, he, he's young and spry, but he's been at this for a very long time. And he is the importer of Luxardo cherries. And I mentioned to him one day my love for Luxardo cherries. Three days later, there were 50 pounds of Luxardo cherries here at the distillery. It was simultaneously one of the best and worst experiences <laughs> of my life. I, uh, my blood sugar level spiked off the charts. Uh, I made Luxardo cherry ice cream, uh, which by the way, do it. Uh, I don't have a recipe. I winged it. It's what I do. Um, uh, I don't think you can fail. Uh, maybe you can add too much and it won't freeze because of the sugar content, right. but, right. um, but yeah, I, so I had, I, there was a box that had six of the big cans oh. and then, and then a metric shit ton of the jars. It was it was incredible, uh, and and Tony, if you're listening, I, I still I, I still owe you. Thank yeah, you. That's amazing. If uh, you could have a cocktail with anybody in the world, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Just paint us a picture. So I, um, it's going to sound lame. I'd probably I would probably go and sit and drink Death in the Afternoons with Ernest Hemingway. Uh, and, and as we drank more and more of them, challenge him to do stupid feats of, of physical activity, uh, and see which one of us broke ourselves first. Uh, I, I, I love a lot of his stories. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not a crazy Hemingway fan like so many people can be, but, uh, there's certain stories of his. I, I wanted to name a whiskey after one of his stories, the short, happy life of Francis McComber. Okay. Uh, if you're familiar with it. Uh, it's, it's an amazing story. If you're not, I go take 20 minutes and read it. Right. Um, but, uh, the other side of that is when we first got our label approved for absinthe, uh, I brought a bottle of champagne to the distillery and made everybody death in the afternoon. So there's a special place in my heart for that cocktail. So being able to share one with, with him and, uh, and swap war stories with him would be a lot of fun. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. What's a common or traditional cocktail ingredient? And this, this actually might be a little tricky for you because you've been in the distilling game for such a long time, but what's a common or traditional ingredient that you've never had and why? Hey, um, Honestly, I think you stumped me. I don't know that, or, or maybe I'm stumping you because I don't think that there's anything that I haven't tried. Um, you know, from China to Baijiu to, uh, to, I mean, even as, 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 um, lowbrow as Malibu rum, mm -hmm. I've, uh, I've tried them all. Um, I haven't, I mean, Amarula is, uh, probably a rare one, uh, African cream liqueur. I haven't tried that. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right, but, uh, know. so that's, that's probably the only thing I haven't tried. Uh, Tony, if you import that, please don't send me 50 gallons of Amarula. <laughs> I got, uh, to try a prickly pear spirit or liqueur from Angola, I okay. think, which was interesting. Uh, I, they're doing some stuff in Africa. I, uh, I, I've made prickly pear distillate. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I go as weird as I had a um, I had a yak's milk distillate that came from Mongolia. So, I dude, I've tried it all. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. that is fantastic. Um, this has been awesome, Lance. Uh, I can't imagine people not being able to find Saint George Spirit. Um, online. Uh, but could you just take us through the best ways to digitally connect with you? Um, could you talk a little bit about when people can actually physically come and, and take some tours of the distillery here? Yeah, you bet. So, uh, so the distillery is open to the public, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday from noon to seven Sunday, noon to five. Uh, for, for tours and tastings. Mm -hmm. uh, best to uh, go online to stgeorgespirits.com, just S-T-G-E-O-R-G, -E spirits, plural, dot com. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and you can go to our tasting room page and, uh, and book a reservation. Uh, best to do that if, if you've got a group, especially over, over two. Um, and then, um, you know, I'll have to get back to you on, uh, on things like our, uh, our Facebook page, our Instagram and our Twitter because um, I stay away from all that. That's I'm, good. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a technophobe, but uh, I'm not allowed to address the public most of the time. So for, for good reason. Well, there you go. I'm well, a loose cannon. Well, I appreciate this rare opportunity then. It's uh, a pleasure. And, and we will definitely link to all of those things on the show notes right. page over at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast. So if you want to give them a follow or a subscribe, that's where you should head. And uh if you're not already subscribed to this podcast, then yeah, you should do that too. What's wrong with you? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Lance, thanks so much for being My on the pleasure. Podcast. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here and by spreading the word you're helping us fight the good fight you can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear also definitely follow us on instagram and facebook at modern bar cart for cocktail porn recipes and entertaining tips and Keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, 
spirits and flavor insights courtesy of Lance Winters and St. George Spirits, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2020.